relationship to the school. And it was a great first step. The program allows for projects within a two-mile radius of the school. Uh, but when we started looking at those project locations and comparing them to our dot maps, we found that not all of the projects were awarded um, would be heavily used by students. So that's when we brought in Doug and Transystems to the team to help us with more advanced GIS. They helped us develop procedures to determine where students would most likely travel. And this has really helped us as we begin working with the large school districts I was talking about. Um, uh, typically, our largest districts have a lot of need, and this helps us narrow the focus to where the, uh, we can best use our funds. So um, why don't you go to the next box, slide, and I'm just going to intersperse here of where Ohio is. Um, we have Safe Routes Project. 88 out of our 88 counties. 2005, we've awarded $60 million um, in infrastructure and non-infrastructure projects. Um, over 200 infrastructure projects, which are sidewalks, safer crossings, a few bridges here and there, um, small bridges. And um, over 300 non-infrastructure projects, which are the education and encouragement programs I was talking about. Um, next slide. Um, we do actually, I said crash data wasn't that high, but we do actually have some impressive cash crash data. So since 2008, um, when we started tracking um, bicycle and pedestrian crashes with that narrow two miles around each K-8 school in the state, um, we have found that um, those total crashes involving bicycles and pedestrians have um, decreased by 28.5%. It's not that way all over the state for every crash, but with our specific age group it is. Um, the next slide. Um, so this, this slide just shows you typically what has to be in a school travel plan. And in order for any community in Ohio to get funding, they have to develop a plan. And we do help them do that through the um, State Cross to School funds that we have. And it just lays out the process for improving safety and encouraging children to walk or bike to school. And then one more slide for me. And this just tells you what our three key items we look for in this plan. We want to know where the kids are coming from, how are they, what travel mode are they currently using, why are they using that mode, and then we work on those issues to see how we can make things better for them. And thank you. So up to you, Doug, now. All right. Well, thank you, Julie. Um, yeah, so this, this slide here is kind of giving you a, a snapshot of how many schools were actually were our participant as part of the uh, school travel plan. In Toledo, had 40 schools, Akron 42, and in Columbus, uh, 89. Um, okay, so as, as Julie was talking about, data is needed, right? So one of the things we do as GIS professionals is we crunch a lot of data and we overlay things spatially and we help them make sense for decision support system purposes for planning and things like that. So things like Julie already talked about, you know, where are the students, where are the school locations, attendance zones, um, buffer zones of schools, the crash data, looking at those bike and ped crashes that involve the school age children. Um, and then also one of the things that can be very, very helpful is if you use network analysts, and it looks like we have elevated music, but uh, shortest uh, shared path roadway segments can also be identified. If you know where the students are and you know where the school is, you can map the shortest path for all of them. We still, are we still on, everybody? Yes, I can hear you. You're still on. Okay. I'm just confused. Okay. All right. So, uh, GIS technology integration, right? So GIS is at the heart of all this uh, geospatial type of analysis. So you need ARC, you need uh, ArcMap, and you need all the different geoprocessing tools. I can tell you all the tools that are um, defined and used in these school travel plans can be done on a basic license level, um, although many of the tools uh, I also use are in the advanced. But wanted to throw that out there. You can do these, these types of analysis with even a basic license level. Um, do need model builder, so not sure who all have had the model builder builder experience. Whether you're, you know, Python scripting in ArcPy or creating something from Arc Toolbox geoprocess tools, things like that. Um, but you can uh, ultimately identify what we call priority potential priority corridors, and those corridors are then used to identify um, through the public where projects make sense for non-infrastructure and infrastructure-related purposes, okay? 
Um, custom maps are also developed. The map on the graphic on the right is an indicator of some of those uh, type of analysis that's been done, where the students are in the black dots, the schools in the center, and the radius in the, uh, around the school. So we'll start with a base map. You've got to geocode your students, right? So um, obviously no uh, private information is obtained in the GIS, simply the age group or the, the age affiliation of the student doesn't tell you male or female, just gives us an address too. So we need to know the address, the, a, the school age um, group, and then we can map it. So then we map, you have a dot, a bunch of dots centered all over around, and then you kind of focus, you start to, start, the data starts to come together a little bit for you. For you. Then you bring in network analysts, and then network analysts, not sure who my network analyst folks are, but if you haven't used it, I'm going to put a plug in for it. It's a fantastic tool that is very, very useful for analyzing um, trip distance, short, you know, analysis, identifying shortest path, and things like that, which is why um, we wanted to use this for ODOT on these projects. So what we chose was the closest facility analysis option under network analysts. And that we're able then to map the shortest output of all the, the travel path for, for each student to the school. All right, so you bring that in as like a feature class. And now you have a map that's starting to show you where all these segments are. And what's interesting about that is that a lot of these shortest paths, which is exactly what ch children do, is they take the shortest way to school. Um, and history has shown us that. So you can, you can ultimately start to see a pattern, even more of a pattern starting to fill up here. Okay, so this next slide here is actually the model builder integration. So we developed a, an ARC toolbox um, for all my GIS techie people here. You'll get excited about this. We take a model builder script and all the different processes, which are basically taking an input uh, street network, running this, the, the uh, closest facility analysis, getting an output on it, and then generating what is those segments that are shared the most based upon that shortest path. And so what ends up happening is then automatically the tool automatically outputs sort of a heat ramp map, which is what you see in this graphic here at the bottom, um, indicating sort of where are those segments showing up the most as part of a shortest uh, uh, path analysis, okay? All right, so then that's just the first step. That's just the GIS piece, right? Then you got a whole planning piece and you have a stakeholder engagement strategy piece that's required as well. So you present these maps, you get with the stakeholders, the principals, uh, uh, various stakeholders that are identified as part of the project, and you sit down and you look at the maps, right? Kind of like the picture on the left. You're sitting down and you're looking at the maps. And then identify as a team which corridors really make the most sense for us to look at potential projects, okay? Because ultimately we want projects that are going to serve multiple schools, okay? So out of this last, I'll slide back to this real quick. You can kind of see the reds, the orange, uh, the yellows and things like that popping up because that's what the data is suggesting us. And then this is the actual output of this type of exercise through the stakeholders. Um, okay, so from an infrastructure, once we have the corridors identified, now we want to start identifying projects. Okay, and again, they're focused on priority corridors as Julie was alluding to. And we get all that information, like I said, we put it in, um, uh, we start mapping some of those actual projects, and uh, then we, we actually have sort of an algorithm, a scoring type of uh, matrix that's applied. Some of the non-infrastructure methodology of projects, because like I said, we have in infrastructure and non-infrastructure, it might be focused on policies and programs for the non-infrastructure. Um, not going to read all this stuff here, but there's a lot of things such as um, surveys that are used to gain information about what might be appropriate for a particular improvement. Um, and those might be on-campus pedestrian and bicycle accommodations. Um, it could be making sure there's a bike rack if there's not a bike rack. It could be improving school zone paint marking, things like that, okay? Um, infrastructure is a little bit different, right? So we're actually putting something constructible together, right? And so a lot of that might be, well, let's bridge the gap of sidewalks. Um, so where sidewalk gaps are, 
Um, and we want to focus on the, uh, the pedestrian and bicycle potential. All right? So we want to encourage kids where feasible to walk and bicycle more to school and also where parents are, cons are, are comfortable with it as well. Okay? Um, feasibility also is uh, an important thing to look at. Estimated costs, right? Costs go up. It's nothing is free to put in the ground. Um, right-of-way requirements also might be a factor if right-of-way is required. But it's ultimately got to get um, support, okay? These projects have to have support. Um, Non-infrastructure non uh, for the prioritization is, might be the feasibility. Um, has to be in alignment with the steering committee's vision and goals and all that. Um, this map here is an example of how multiple schools are identifying priority corridors and projects that are benefiting all these schools, okay? And so these, this countermeasure might show, okay, bridging sidewalk gaps, um, creating new sidewalks. It could be um, installing pedestrian head counters near the school, um, improving a, a school zone, and, so, and things like that, okay? Um, ultimately, there's a goal of creating a adoptable uh, final plan, okay? It's kind of like the pass-fail, right? You get the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Um, want to get public input on this. We want to finalize those countermeasures, get the mapping done, put it into the actual document, and put it into something that's implementable, ready to go, as factual, has the information, ready that when funding comes in, it's ready to go, right? Shovel ready, essentially. Um, so the impetus of this, of, of, the, of, of this presentation we gave at GIST in Des Moines was the focus on GIS being a very important collaboration tool. That GIS is not just data. It's smart data. It's data that helps to convey uh, information that can be used to support important planning decisions, right, so we shape our future. And this is a great example, great project example, and, and Julie was, was gracious to embrace the GIS technology and how it's been used for the project and to support it as part of the stakeholder engagement strategy. But it's been a, um, you know, we've noticed that this type of collaboration, though, comes through that clear, constant communication with the stakeholders. Okay, you got to keep people involved. Nobody wants to be left out, right? Um, Esri ArcGIS software and Model Builder is a very powerful combination tool. For those of you that are more advanced and have used Model Builder, I'm just preaching to the choir. For those of you in the t on, on this call that have not engaged themselves in Model Builder, I highly suggest that you learn and and and, and get yourself. Uh, started in that. It's a great tool. Um, you know, my understanding as a GIS practice leader of where Esri's technology is going is it's here to stay. A model builder of tools are going to get enhanced and become more part of an enterprise GIS workflow. Um, but you can do a lot of powerful things with it, as well as network analysts. So when you take ArcGIS, model builder, and you bring network analysts into it, you have a very, very powerful and what I would call defendable analysis tool that starts to show the information. So now we have a tool that uh, ODOT is able to use for other purposes and basically anything that's looking for a shared path frequency. It doesn't have to be related to school, um, but it's, so it's, an, it's a tool that can serve multiple purposes whenever there's a frequency analysis needed uh, based on shortest path type of analysis. So with that, on behalf of Julie and I, I want to say thank you for your time, and um, I guess we'll reserve questions to the end here. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Doug and Julie. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can go ahead and type them in down in the chat uh, uh, area down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll take those now if anyone has any questions. Though I will um, I reiterate what Doug is saying about network analysts. We use network analysts all the time here um, in the Office of People Transportation, and it has that dual capability of not only creating data, 
uh, the results that you get when using network analysis, but you also do have what you say here in your slide, a powerful visual of what you actually have, and you can show that to non-data people or non-GIS people to show them exactly what you're talking about. It makes it makes a very nice picture that's very that can be useful for explaining very easily to people what you're actually doing in your data. So I I, I wholeheartedly agree. With network analyst rules. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So um, do we have any questions or should we move on to the next one? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come in yet, so um, we can still take questions later as well, but why don't we go ahead and move on to uh, Katie O'Sullivan's uh, mapping bike share trips. You want to go ahead and share your screen? Sure. All right, can everyone hear me and see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so I'll be talking about a project I did last fall comparing the spatial density of bike share trips with the coverage of New York City's on-street bike facilities, um, facilities including bike lanes, cycle tracks, sharrows, signed routes, and I wanted to get a better sense of how well those facilities are accommodating the travel behavior of cyclists. Um, and I'd really value the perspective of this group on the kinds of challenges and opportunities of applying this kind of approach in your own work. So um, please don't hesitate with questions at the end or if you want to follow up with me later. So before I launch in, um, just give you a brief outline of what I'll cover. First, I'll introduce to you the project idea and some background information. Take a look at other bike share research that informed the scope of my project. Describe the methods I used. Show you the maps and the results discuss how these findings and the general approach could be applied by transportation officials, and then some concluding remarks on my optimism for the future of bike trip mapping and bicycle planning. Um, so as I said, this is a project um, I did last fall and is a relatively simple application of GIS, but I do think it has powerful implications for transportation planning because it addresses a big information gap. And that gap is, where is it that people bike when they bike within cities? How is bicycle traffic distributed across the street network? This is definitely a question worth looking into, because in transportation planning, it's really important to have good data on travel patterns as a foundation for everything, for travel demand forecasting models, for micro simulations, for all the tools that planners use to make informed decisions on what kinds of projects or investments to prioritize. But relative to vehicular traffic, good data on bicycle and pedestrian activity has been hard to get, but there's growing impetus to support these alternative modes for a variety of reasons, um, financial, environmental, health, social. But in order to support them well, we need to know more about trip patterns. So enter bike share system data. Um, now, bike share trips aren't the perfect data set because users are a very specific subset of all cyclists in a city and their movement is confined to a network of stations. But in New York City, at least, it's an incredibly large data set. It continuously logs thousands of trips every day across 330 stations, and that provides a lot more spatial richness than, say, a handful of point counts conducted a few times a year um, by the DOT, which is still an important effort, but um, bike share system data provides a really good place to start um, to probe deeper. Now, plenty of studies have mapped bike share trips as point data for origins and destinations separately, but what I did in this analysis is I connected those points with desire lines, which approximate the general area a cyclist will traverse on their trip. Now, to be sure, it's a rough approximation, but the point data overlooks the space between stations, which is really important. It's where the biking happens. So, um, by mapping the density of desire lines instead of points, I wanted to get a sense of those important corridors for bicycle travel. The data on this slide is from the New York City Department of Transportation, and it shows two relationships that really motivated me to do this project because they're key for increasing the modal share of bicycling in cities. The graph on the left shows that over the past decade, the expanding network of on-street bicycle facilities, shown here in miles, has been linked with a commensurate increase in ridership, um, represented by this cycling indicator. 
And then the graph on the right contrasts the growth in this cycling indicator with the decreasing risk for collision and injury. So there really is safety in numbers. The safer people feel, the more likely they are to bike. In fact, it's estimated that about 60% of the population is interested in cycling for transportation, but has very legitimate safety concerns. So by targeting bike facility investments in the locations where they're most demanded and will create the most effective network, planners can catalyze a really significant shift towards biking. Um, this graph shows the current state of the practice for monitoring bicycle travel in New York City. The DOT conducts these counts three times a year at now seven key entry points to Manhattan and uses them to derive the cycling indicator shown in the previous slide. And so this graph shows there's been really impressive growth in the count since 2005 at those seven points, but there's definitely more to the story spatially. So next I'll take a look at some research involving bike share or regular bike trip data in GIS that probe a little deeper and inform the scope of my own project. Tracking individual movement in real time um, with smartphones or other mobile devices is the wave of the future for transportation data collection, I think. And in some ways, it's already here with fitness applications like Human, a company that's generated maps like this of trips taken by walking, running, and biking on urban street networks all over the world, like here in Manhattan. And the level of detail or precision offered by this data is really extraordinary but the sample is small and biased. It's fitness app users, and the fact that these trips are for fitness and not for transportation really limits their applicability, at least for now. But this technology is spreading quickly and presents a great opportunity for measuring bicycle and pedestrian activity above and beyond bike share system data. It's important to keep in mind, first and foremost, um, bike share data is operational data. It's used for operational purposes, like keeping the number of bikes balanced between all stations so that a customer at any, any, at any given point can access a bike when they need to. And that rebalancing purpose was the motivation for this study out of Columbia University, which mapped origins and destinations separately to see how activity shifted across the city over 24 hours. And they found that transit hubs like Union Square, Grand Central, and Penn Station um, were hot spots during peak travel hours, and then activity switched over to the East Village and Lower East Side area at night. One last example of another project. This is from a blog called I Quant New York, and it's a good example of using the city bike system data to better understand the general experience of biking in a city. It's a Google map where all of the collisions between bicycle and vehicles in um, 2013 were assigned to the closest city bike station to compare injury density across space and identify hot spots such as um, off of the Williamsburg Bridge on Delancey Street. So these other studies shed some light on how biking varies across space and time within a city, but I didn't see any research that used the lens of bicycle planning um, to align trip density with infrastructure. Nor did any of these studies make use of the linear perspective available within city bike system data. So I set out to map the density of bike share trip desire lines to compare areas of highest traffic with the existing bike facilities to determine priority areas for investment and improvement. These were the main um, data sources that I used. From the New York City DOT, a shapefile of the city's bike route network as of 2010, and then from the city bike systems data, I chose three months representing peak and non-peak seasons based across the year and a half that the system had been open. So the months I chose were July and December 2013 and May 2014. For each of the three months, these are the methods I used to make the density maps. Um, I took the spreadsheet from City Bike of the hundreds of thousands of trips for each month, converted that into a cross tab or a trip chart that showed every possible pair of starting and ending points, and for each tallied the number of trips. I restructured that into a table that I was able to um, put into GIS 
and apply the XY to line function to create a map of the desire lines. And with those lines, I use the line density function to create the heat map. In calculating the density, I used a search radius of about two north-south blocks in lower Manhattan to try and account for some of the deviations cyclists will inevitably take from that straight line path approximation. And then with this heat map, I could then compare hotspots to the existing network of bicycle facilities to identify strengths and areas for improvement. This graph is just to give you some context about the sample I took. It shows the number of trips taken each day since the system opened at the end of May 2013, every day through July 2014, the most recent time period for which data was available um, when it was accessed last fall. So it's important to note this system data excludes trips that are false starts or a trip shorter than a minute, as well as um, trips taken for testing and monitoring by city bike staff, so this data really should reflect just users. And I've highlighted here in red the months that I used for my sample and for the mapping. These are some key numbers from each month to give you some reference before going to the maps. The table shows the number of active stations, the number of user trips taken each month, as well as the number of routes or unique desire lines these trips were distributed across. And I noticed that the most popular routes recurred through all three months, and they were pairs of the same origin and destination concentrated around Central Park, uh, which suggests that they're recreational trips rather than for transportation, which was unexpected. And I wondered how prominent these leisurely or kind of jaunt-type trips with the same origin and destination were, so I calculated their percentage of the total, and it's a relatively small proportion, just 1 to 3 percent of trips. Um, so while those recreational trips are concentrated in particular places, like around Central Park, and it's important to consider the needs of those users from an urban design perspective, um, they don't comprise a huge portion of total bike share usage. These maps are the output of the XY to line function representing all the desire lines with at least one trip for each month. The darker blue the line, the more trips taken that month between the stations it connects. Um, and then the city's on-street bicycle network is overlaid on top. These maps were a little noisy to interpret too closely. I just wanted to show them because they were the input for the heat maps. And you can decipher some general patterns from them and the directionality of outbound trips from different stations, especially the ones at the periphery. These line density maps are mainly what I relied on to interpret the data. The scale is held constant between the three images, um, so you can make direct visual comparisons of the density of trips. And in making these comparisons, I found that the hotspots don't really move around between the months. They do differ in magnitude. Of course, December is lighter blue because there were fewer trips, but the hotspots um, didn't shift within the city from month to month. And the pattern that jumps out most is the concentration of trips that follows the diagonal Broadway corridor south of Times Square, which has continuous facilities for bikes. And 8th Avenue is another corridor with good facilities and high density. But the pocket of highest density fans out right around Union Square, a big transit hub. And there's another hotspot by Grand Central Terminal, the busiest subway station in the city, um, which doesn't currently have good north-south connection um, through a bike corridor. Um, so I kind of just went over the findings, but to summarize, there are high densities along north-south corridors with continuous bike facilities like Broadway and 8th Avenue, so maintenance on those routes should be prioritized. Um, also high densities around the transit hubs, um, suggesting that linkages between bike share and transit are really important, but given this importance, there are some gaps in the bike facility network. So. Um, the next phase of my project was to apply these findings like a planner might and recommend expansions to the network to improve its connectivity. And those expansions are highlighted in this map in the teal color um, with landmarks starred. Um, so they're meant to link Grand Central Station with Central Park to the north because Central Park currently only has one good access point for cyclists coming from the south on the western corner. 
And then to better connect Grand Central and Union Square, I recommended a facility along Madison Avenue. Um, and around Union Square itself, I recommended demarcating space for cyclists separate um, from the pedestrian walkway and extending a new facility on the west side of the square southwards um, to connect to East 10th Street. Um, so this is a closer look at what a new facility might look like based on the street characteristics and the NACSO Urban Bikeway Design Guide. Uh, Madison Avenue currently has three lanes of northbound traffic with one lane of parking, so I recommended replacing one of those lanes with a two-direction cycle track buffered from traffic with post and the parking lane. And then around the perimeter of Union Square, I recommended a walkway, as I mentioned, um, to provide pedestrians and cyclists some refuge from each other. And then on the Street University Place, which extends southwards on the west side of the square and is very narrow, I recommended Sharrows or a signed route that connects with the east-west bike lane on 10th Street. So this project was exploratory. Um, it just kind of begins to scratch the surface of everything that can be done with bike share trip analysis and mapping. Uh, the interface between bike share and transit emerged as a really important trend, but there's a lot more to consider in improving connection between these modes aside from the on-street bike facility network, um, such as the design of transit stations, of bus stops, transit vehicle design, crosswalks, curb cuts, bike parking, all of those aspects need to be considered. With expansion of city bike into uptown Manhattan, Queens, and more of Brooklyn, mapping bike share trips may help guide expansion of the route network in these areas with less extensive coverage. The stations in Brooklyn were included in this analysis, but because density is so much higher in Manhattan, um, Brooklyn more or less got overlooked, so that smaller scale, more localized analysis will help illuminate patterns in those outerlying boroughs. Um, bike share systems with GPS-enabled bikes, especially those that are not station-based, provide an opportunity for capturing precise routes of cyclists and their unconfined movement. And um, in general, tracking continuous trip movement across space will become an increasingly viable data source compared to point count data obtained from, from field studies in the past um, because of um, the increased usage of mobile devices. And then finally, um, in its current state, bike share system data captures some other useful variables that would be interesting to map, such as trips by gender, um, by different age ranges, time of day of trips, and also day of the week. Um, so in conclusion, um, bike share trips offer a really unprecedented um, volume of data and level of spatial detail, um, which provides the opportunity to um, map desire lines, which I did in this project. Um, the hot spots that I found were along north-south corridors with existing bike facilities and also around transit hubs, um, which perhaps warrant more attention or should be prioritized um, for expansions to the network. And then looking ahead, I think that the availability of data on bicycle and pedestrian trip patterns will increase greatly, um, both through GPS-enabled bikes and bike share systems as that spreads to more cities and as networks within cities grow, but also through um, smartphone technology and mobile devices. Um, so I'm very optimistic in the future of um, planning better for bicycle and pedestrians and strategically investing in infrastructure to accommodate and encourage alternative modes of transportation. And that's all. Thanks so much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. I think uh, people can see why I thought these two uh, presentations work so well together. <laughs> they show very different methods of uh, obtaining more or less the same data um, with different data sets, obviously. But uh, I thought they really, really worked well together and showed that there are always multiple ways of, of getting to the same answer. Um, so if you have any questions for Katie, uh, please go ahead and type them down in the chat box. Um, we did have one question for you. Doug, are you still there? 
is. Yep, I'm here. Okay, there was one question that came in after we started um, Katie's presentation, so I thought we should uh, hit that one first. Uh, sure. the, que the question was, was the, the network that you used for your analysis, was it a multimodal network? The good question. No, it was not, although it would be very, very easy to apply a multimodal network through this type of analogy uh, analysis. You could easily you know, say, well, we're assuming some of the kids might even take a bus or uh, you know, if they were to bike, you can include that as well. Um, but no, this, this one, this was just using a street network with um, assumed travel speed of X amount of miles per hour and, you know, um, shortest path following sort of road junctions, if you will. But, it, I mean, you very easily could. We actually have applied a multimodal network on other projects, other states, and so forth, but did not for this purpose. Okay. Um, actually, we just got another question for you as well, Doug. Mm -hmm. um, it says, can this process be used on a web application in real time to plan a route from point A to B? Yeah, it can. Um, the, the, the way you, you would need it is you would need an ArcGIS for server application um, to be able to run network analyst in the background. And you could easily, you know, create either a JavaScript application or um, there's some other other types of uh, freeware um, A to B type of analysis that you could, you know, kind of like Google Maps and things that that's a little bit more specific on a pedestrian side. Um, but if you wanted to use your GIS data, uh, you, you would need to be able to have something on the fly. If you did it web enabled, you'd have to have ArcGIS for server with network analyst extension on top of server running it. Right, and you could also use, uh, if you have an ArcGIS online uh, organizational account, you can also make web applications using that uh, account and do network analysts uh, in whatever application you make. Of course, it does cost money. <laughs> yeah, everything costs, unfortunately. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, and I'm not sure this last question, how and where did you obtain the network data? I think that's for you, Doug. Yeah, we had we got um, yeah Ohio DOT uh, uses the uh, location-based response system, which is kind of an E911 universal street network uh, data set, and it's linear referenced. Um, so we utilized that, and then created a func using you basically create used uh, speeds and calculated. Um, your cost allocation in minutes based upon roadway functional classification. So, in other words, you know, there's so much speed for so forth. So, anyway, it you, you take it from a road perspective and then take it down to where pedestrians would utilize it. So, okay. but it's utilizing a, a universal Ohio-based data set. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Doug or Julie? If not, um, we can. Um um, just can the presenters email the presentations to the webinar attendees? Well, the um, webinar itself will be is being recorded and will be posted on the New York State GIS Association website uh, in possibly a week or so, and it will also be on the New York State GIS Association YouTube channel. So um, it will be available on either of those sources. Uh, if you just go to YouTube and type in New York State GIS Association, you'll be able to find the channel, no problem. Um, and I think we can move on to, uh, to uh, Katie's uh, presentation. Um, first off, we had a question about uh, what is a desire line. I think you sort of covered that, but maybe you could elaborate a little more on that, where you got that term, because that's not a term that I think most GIS people um, are familiar with. It's certainly not something that's uh, used in network yeah. analyst. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually um, wasn't familiar with the term either until after I completed the project. It's just um, a line connecting an origin and a destination when um, the intermittent route is unknown. So in the project, I used some long-winded phrase like origin-destination pair, or um, I would just refer to them as route, but um, my, my supervisor um, at IBI group where I was interning this past year um, referred to them as desire lines. <laughs> and so um, it was sort of a, I thought that was a lot more concise. Um, and so I suppose it, it's used in certain, certain sectors of um, transportation planning. I think more so with among bicycle and pedestrian planners um, to kind of 
examine potential potential routes to connect important important points. Okay. Um, actually, the the term that I think that would be analogous in network analysts is even more cumbersome. It's an origin destination cost matrix. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I think design line is probably uh, certainly a lot sexier. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 more 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 um, approachable, I think. Um, I had one question for you, Katie. I was just curious if you'd um, presented any of your results to City Bike and what their response was. I yes, I am. Um, so the the course that I prepared this project for was taught by Jeff Olson of Alta Planning and Design, the company that used to own City Bike. It was um, sold this past fall. Um, so the the analysis and the paper was sent to the the head of the Alta Bike Share System um, department, and I didn't get any particular feedback from him. Um, <laughs> he just said it was interesting, but um, yeah, I'm curious. I'm sure, you know, on on the City Bike um, website, all sorts of reports are uploaded that kind of look on a monthly basis on on just general trends and usage, but I'm sure internally um, there there's quite a bit of analysis going on just for market research and um, for the rebalancing, such as that study out of Columbia I mentioned. Um, but it's definitely a, a really exciting kind of wealth of, of data on travel behavior, I think. Yay to open data, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Um, so, do we have any more questions from the audience? We have a nice, uh, nice uh, attendee list today. We have 34 people listening, in, which is which is nice. So, um, if we don't have any more questions, I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, did you have any comments, Doug or Julie, or? No, just wanted to say thank you very much for everybody's uh, time this afternoon, and um, my contact information is there. Julie's contact information. Just let us know if you have any other questions. We're happy to help you. Right. Great. And um, and if anyone is interested in getting involved in the Transportation Professional Affiliation Group, please do give me an email. Um, my email address is kjenkins5 at schools.newyorkcity.gov. I'll actually type that in as well. Um, and But I think we can uh, wrap it up here. Did you have anything you need to say, Garvis? Uh, no, just thank you for everybody. And I put a couple of uh, messages in for the chat there. One is for those non-members uh, of the uh, New York State GIS Association, please visit our website. I have it there. It's NewYorkStateGIS.net for uh, joining. It's uh, only $10 to join. I mean, you get a wealth, wealth of information, plus you, with webinars and everything, plus you get to view the ones that are in the archive as, as they are right now. And also, at the end, when you exit out, please uh, complete the, the short and brief survey there. It'll help us out, and then uh, we can move ahead from there. Yeah, I would, I would uh, repeat what Garz just said about the website. It's really a terrific website, and there's a lot of information there, including all the videos uh, that Garvis mentioned. But one of the most important things there, or the most useful things there, is they have a great GIS jobs board uh, where all, pretty much all uh, GIS jobs, in, in, at least in the Northeast, um, will be posted very quickly, and it's a very comprehensive list and updated daily, practically. So uh, check that out for sure. <laughs> um, so with that, I think we're done. And we can say thank you to everybody, and thank you for your attention, and especially thanks to Katie, Doug, and Julie. I uh, had great time uh, at the I/O conference, and your presentations definitely uh, were were outstanding. So, thank, thank you so much. Thank oh, you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Oh, yeah, bye. Oh, presenters, please stay on the line real quick for a second. I was yes. going to end the recording. Okay. Oh, okay.